Hey, welcome back to another edition of Limited Skills. I'm James. And I'm Brandon. And we're going to talk about the seal decks we played in that week where we didn't post a video. So I went to Common Room to play Magic because Brandon was in some GP somewhere. GP Richmond. Yeah, and I was expecting to draft, and then they let me know that it was sealed. In fact, they let me know that they let me know the previous week that it was sealed, and I just wasn't paying attention. <laughs> so You get very distracted by holding that camera. Yeah, I, except I was playing Magic. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I don't do that. So I opened up a sealed pool and thought, well, I'll play some Magic. And uh, this is what I ended up with. I ended up with uh, Blue White Skies. Mostly, I saw a Glyph Keeper. And I remember Brandon saying that if you play that, you'll win. <laughs> Full support of Glyph Keeper and for choosing blue for Glyph Keeper. So I thought, well, blue is probably my best color set. And... Um, Man, and then I wasn't sure quite what to do when I finally put this together. I, I didn't love it. I've got two copies of Avon Initiate, and he turned out to be amazing. Um, the 3-2 flyer for four is a huge threat. People had a really hard time. If they couldn't deal with it, he would kill them by himself. And then he's got Embalm, so if they do kill it, when I get to seven, kills him again. Uh, I, have, I have a lot of Embalm creatures. I have... Embalm does a lot of work. Yeah. Like, the worst Embalm creatures are pretty good. Yeah. I have two Unwavering Initiates, who is the Vigilant Embalm for five, and that value seems really important, because I didn't have a lot to do at five. My curve is, what, two, three, four, five? So that value is, was real, real good. Um, Gus Walker, he was fine. He's a two-drop. Uh, he beats in for two, and sometimes he was a flyer, so... They I like would, him a ton. They would play blockers, and I would just go ignore them. This deck seems really good and consistent. Um, yeah, I think this is absolutely right. I think Glyphkeeper, other than being insane, I, I agree that these Avon Initiates, I assume they probably won you a lot of games. And yeah. Having to, having to deal with two <laughs> flyers that are 3 twos, like that'll murder and people. And it's like I've got four of them. Yeah, um, exactly. But, but this was great. So I have the two Embalms here. I have the two Embalms here. He has Embalm. And then I have the Avon Wing Guide, who gives all your Embalm tokens Flying and Vigilance. And I know, yeah... I mean, him being a 2-3 Flying Vigilance for 4 is, is fine anyway. Yeah. yeah. So this guy was... When he hit the table, that if they couldn't remove him, that was often game over. Uh, I really loved Prepare. I splashed green for Fight and for Champion of Ronus. And I think even if I wasn't playing Champion of Ronus, I would still play Prepare to Fight just for Prepare. Yeah, I think prepare is worth it. I agree on that. The untap. So I would I would untap the devoted crop mate or not. I mean he's a vigilant, so I guess he doesn't ever tap. But I would untap a creature, give him plus two plus two, trade, gain a bunch of life, and then bring the creature back from the graveyard. It was just devastating for people. Uh, I think the least good card in the deck was the Zenith Seeker. I've heard that repeatedly from people. I haven't played it myself, but everybody seems like, oh, he seems amazing, and then he's kind of meh. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the good, the best blue creatures already have flying anyway, so you're not always doing anything when you cycle with him. Yeah, So, and I didn't have a lot of cycling to turn him on, so he, I mean, yeah, he, I think he was the, probably the weakest creature in the deck. Him and the Tawcrop Skirmisher. Uh, Did you get good use out of the champion? Sometimes. Sometimes I got to play Champion of Ronus and then cheat out Glyph Keeper. Ooh, that's yeah. cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say beyond that, I don't know that. I think splashing green for the fight if you're already playing prepare seemed. I thought I thought that seemed a little weird, but not bad. Like champion's good. Mm -hmm. There were there were a couple of games where I didn't get to cast him, but most of the time if he came out, I got value out of him, or he ate a removal spell because they were afraid I was gonna play something huge. <laughs> I, the fear of yeah. it alone is probably worth it. Yeah, that's a good yeah. call. Um. So. James may have very well built his best deck available here, but his pool overall, he, he showed me what he wasn't playing, is also really good. His red has two Magma Sprays, two Pursue Glories, two Desert Ceridons. Um, let's see, his, I, his I bet, black uh, had a few good medium-sized creatures and Plague Belcher. Um, and he had cut to ribbons as well. Uh yeah, his his overall pool was pretty strong. I th I feel like he could have made like three completely different decks that were good, but yeah, uh, I think this is what I would lean towards being strongest. I would have a hard time not forcing that red. That could be a mistake, but <laughs> it was it was real tough. I I threw this deck out because I wanted to see how Glyphkeeper worked, and I tried to 
I tried to look at all the other colors to see how well they paired with blue because I knew that Glyph Keeper is just insane. And every time I laid out, I laid out my green and I laid out my black and I saw they each had a, an area of strength but they didn't have enough creatures. They didn't have enough support to make the deck work. Or like they were, I was missing three drops or it was just top end. Uh, each, each particular color had a, a problem that this deck just didn't have. So this is what I ended up. I ended up going three and one. Yeah. Um, do you remember what beat you or what? Yeah. He was uh, he was red green, and he described himself as a curve with removal, and that's, that's <laughs> that sounds terrifying. Yeah. That's basically all it was. He would just play guys on curve, and then remove my stuff, and um, uh, he won the first game. I won the second, and then the third game, I think I went to five, and then got mana screwed. But even then, it was it was really close. Like I almost came back a couple of times, and then he would just resolve some big dumb thing I couldn't kill, and then ran me over. Fair enough. All right, uh, we're gonna lay out Brandon's neck. Brandon's neck. Br oh and no! Just, just cut his head <laughs> off. Dead. All right, so we'll be back in a minute. Okay, so this is what I played at GP Richmond 2017. Um, so I, my pool was not super exciting to me. Uh, I did get a few really cool rares in blue, and the rest of my blue was not good to support it. Um, I got the four mana Sphinx, which has double blue in its cost, and I had the the clone, which has double blue in its cost, and I had the Drake Haven, which I didn't feel like I quite had enough cycling stuff to justify. So I was sad I didn't get to utilize those things. The reason I settled on black red was specifically this was the combination of colors that got me the highest amount of two and one mana creatures which is three <laughs> um no other colors i had combined would bring me to three cheap creatures um so i basically played this as my most aggressive version <laughs> which it was not um but i would have probably lost a lot more if i played colors that didn't give me an occasional two drop um it was not really aggressive. It was pretty mid-rangey. Um, I've got a lot of really good removal. That was my focus. Double Electrify was super sweet. Trial of Zeal, the Sweltering Suns, um, occasionally a fling, and the final reward. I, I never got killed by bombs. I always got killed by tempo. Sure. Um, yeah, if anybody had a sweet bomb, thankfully I didn't play against any Glyph, keep, glyph Keepers, because that would have killed me anyway. Uh, you could have Cartouche of Zeal. Nope. And then final reward. I know, you might think that, but you can only enchant a creature you control with cartouches. Oh. It came up in two at a giant at the pre-release a lot. <laughs> uh. Well, you could have Trial of Zeal. Yeah. Final reward. Well, well I've got a story about Trial of Zeal, and right. it's embarrassing, but I'm going to share <laughs> it anyway. <clears throat> okay, so I did have the Archfiend of Ifnir as my sort of big bomb. The, the most excitable thing I had. Its ability mattered a couple of times. Mostly it won games because it was a 5-4 flyer, and that's my biggest, best creature. Um, yeah, I, um, I sort of weaseled my way through the day. I ended up going 4-4 four and four when I dropped. I needed to get 6-3 and three, uh, to make it to day 2. And, you know, I go to play Magic. Even if I'm losing, I'll keep playing. But at that point, I was tired. There was only one round left, so I'd, and that was when I lost my, my fourth match and decided to go home. Um... So, overall, this was okay. If I had maybe a couple more two-drop creatures or a, a big bomby endgame thing like a Hazaret or a Glorybringer, I feel like I would have rocked the house with this. Um, I lost one match to allowing my opponent to hit me with everything when I, I was holding removal and it was risky. I knew it. I let him put me to like three life from 13. And the plan was if he played a blocker, I was going to kill him on the swing back. Um, okay. And then he just had burn afterwards. So it was like, I knew I was taking that risk. I should have maybe hedged my bets in a different direction. That was sure. my own fault, but within reason. Uh, I lost one match when I mulliganed to four. Then I... <laughs> Then I aggroed him down to three life <laughs> and almost won. And the only reason I didn't is because when he got to eight mana, he played the sandworm oh, yeah. protection and I 
could never deal damage to him again, and that was a bummer. Because it was so close to winning on the play, mulliganing to four, while he kept a seven land hand at a competitive level tournament. Oh, he kept a seven land hand? He kept seven, or not seven land, sorry, seven card hand okay. to my four. Sure. Um, and almost came out. The Thresher Lizard getting to play it <laughs> as basically three for a four four. It's a really good reversal for that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, and then, so round eight, I'm four three. If, you know, at that point, if I lose, I'm out from day two. I'm in this situation where... This is the embarrassing part, by the way. Okay. Um, <laughs> this, this is not a mistake you should make when you're learning to play Magic. Not, not to matter <laughs> if you drive 10 hours to get to a competitive tournament. This isn't the kind of crap you should be pulling. Um, so I, I have six mana. I have no creatures on board. My opponent has a... I forget which creatures, but I remember it was a 4-5 and a 2-3. He's, he's got the upper hand on the tempo. Um, I'm holding Sweltering Suns and Trial of Zeal. I was hoping to get better value out of the Sweltering Suns. Uh, but I have to basically spin these two cards to kill his two creatures, just so he's not killing me with stuff anymore. So I, I sort my, my lands out into two piles, one with appropriate mana cost for Sweltering Suns, and one with appropriate mana cost for Trial of Zeal. I play the Trial of Zeal to deal three damage to his four or five. Resolves. Uh, I go to cast Sweltering Suns, and that's when I realize I tapped the wrong pile of lands. So I only have one mountain and two swamps open for that. Uh, so I spent that turn not only accomplishing nothing, but spending my mana just to get rid of my Trial of Zeal and do nothing. And then he still had both of his creatures on board afterwards. And it just conceded that game, which was game two, and I would have won the match. And after I explained that, to him, because it was obvious I made some really stupid mistake when that was what I did for the turn. <laughs> so I explained to him what happened. He already knew I had the Sweltering Suns from the first game. Um, we showed hands and flipped over the next few cards just to compare. I absolutely would have taken that match oh. if I didn't do the most critically stupid mistake. <laughs> I did have a stupid mistake in one of my games. Um, my opponent goes to give one of my flyers minus three, minus three, which kills it. And I think, man, all I need is one blocker to survive the turn, and I'm fine. So I play my combat trick, thinking, oh, it's going to make it an, an X1. And it will live till the end of the turn, and I can block. And then my opponent just, he just makes sure, he's like, you understand that this card is going to die at the end of the turn, right? I'm like, yeah, that's fine. And then he says, you know it's your turn, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so then I scoop and we go to the next game because <laughs> I was dead. I needed him to be alive on my opponent. Yeah, I felt really dumb. Not quite as dumb as that, but still, yeah, yeah, I, I was. It's, it's pretty cool. Forgetting whose turn it is is pretty bad. <laughs> That's true. Um, the the only thing I cited all day long in all eight of my matches uh, was I occasionally put in Splendid Agony, which I would normally main deck, but I just had so much good removal already. Um, I would occasionally take out Pursue Glory for Splendid Agony, depending on how aggressive they were, if I just wanted a way to kill some X1 creatures. Uh, none of the rest of my sideboard in these colors were relevant, uh, so it was, it was yeah. pretty straightforward. It looked like there was nothing else to pl unburden. You could have played unburden. Uh, yeah, I, I missed that opportunity. I'm so sorry, James. Uh, the only comment I have is that Fling is less good the smaller your creatures are. Yes, it was on the chopping block in deck construction, uh, almost in favor of Splendid Agony. However, uh, I, I left it in because I do have some high-end stuff. Yeah. Um, and you can fling a Death Touch creature, can't you? No, uh, it doesn't I think work. Fling does the damage. Yeah. Yeah, so Fling does the damage, so that doesn't have the desired effect. Uh, however, uh, my Thresher Lizard was often a 4-4. Uh, the Pitiless Vizier was 4. Uh, I did get to do a really cool play where I had no instants or sorceries in my graveyard when I cast Warfire Javelinier, I got to target a one-toughness creature with his ability, and with that on the stack, fling him at a two-toughness creature. <laughs> so the fling did two damage, killed his creature, and then when this ability resolved, I had an one instant, instant, in instant and killed his other creature. Oh, that's cute. I never um, would have thought it worked so that, to work it like that. That works really well. Um, and then just getting to... I also got to play the Manticore, um, and in response to... Uh, actually, sorry, I think that's one ability. Well, I gotta play the Manticore and fling him after he got the counter anyway. It was enough damage. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so Fleen did some work. This was the right size deck for that. Um, yeah, overall, I was okay-ishly happy with this deck. Not exciting, but it's not bad at all. Uh, I guess really 4-4 four, four is what you would expect with <laughs> it. Cool. Uh, all right, I guess that's all I've got. Thanks for watching this special edition of Limited Skills, and we'll be back next week. Woo!